big welcome to everyone who is joining us right now, either uh, on Zoom or on Facebook, because we have a, a live event as well on Facebook going on at the same time, of course. So it's just started. Uh, welcome to you all and welcome to Andreas Vu and Alexander Fanta. We will present you in a minute. Uh, this is tonight our fifth Vox Europe Live. Uh, it's going to be in English and uh, we try to alternate between French, English and who knows many more languages soon. It is going to be, it is recorded right now. So I think if you, and it will be displayed in the coming weeks on Vox Europe. So if you don't want viewers to see your home or, you know, your car or whether you're shopping in a supermarket, maybe it's better to turn off your camera. Um, uh, I just say a few words uh, about Vox Europe. I suppose most of you know it, but maybe there are some new people who've never never read Vox Europe and just happened to see the link tonight. Uh, Vox Europe is an independent multilingual website operating as a European press cooperative since 2017, uh, uh, which is the first of its kind actually in Europe. And Vox Europe, of course, existed before, since 2014. It gathers uh, basically a vast community of journalists, translators, experts, media partners, correspondents from all over Europe, and of course, readers as well from all over Europe. One of our main ambitions is to become the European news media for civil society and citizens. Uh, and um, you can read our manifesto. I think uh, somebody yeah, will put it in the chat. You can already start, you know, if you have questions, you can already start, you know, putting them in the chat. And I'll explain, you know, how, how the evening is going to go uh, about in a, in a second. But I first let um, Gian Paolo introduce the subject. Just something I shouldn't forget is to say that Vox Europe is supported um, amongst, among others by its members. So a very, very big thank you to all of you who are here tonight and to everyone who is joining tonight as well. The floor is yours, Gian Paolo. Thank you, Catherine. I'm Gian Paolo Cardo, one of the co-founders uh, along with uh, Catherine and others of Vox Europe. Well, thank so you for presenting me, I forgot. <laughs> This evening, uh, the topic of the evening is uh, uh, how the big, let's say the big tech are influencing our our lives, and should we be uh, afraid of it? So, since the internet has become part of our lives, and even more since social media have become increasingly part of our lives, we've been providing governments and private companies, starting from the so-called GAFA. Uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, with a growing amount on, of what has become the most valued commodity today, personal data. This data is used in the public interest to monitor, plan, and forecast public policies, the business to sell advertisements uh, that matches our alleged needs, and for safety to prevent and monitor diseases or, or disorders. But the frontier between use and abuse is rather blurry, and we have many examples on how data can be used for the bad, like mass surveillance, sneaky advertising, or for inducing unwanted behavior. This evening, we welcome two journalists, Andreas Wu and Alexander Fanta, who did extensive research on the influence of the so-called big tech on the public life and on citizens' privacy on Vox Europe, among others, because we believe this is one of the major issues of our times and Vox Europe cares about the major issues of our times. Okay, here's for the subject and now very briefly about um, Andreas and Alexander. Andreas, you are uh, born, you were born in, in Cyprus. You're actually, I think, in Cyprus today, tonight. You're not there all the time, but you are from this for the time being. And you're a freelance journalist specialized in data journalism, applied to sports, politics, and of course, big tech. You work for several news outlets in Europe and you collaborate to the European Data Journalism Network, EDGNet, which I will present briefly. So the European Data Journalism Network 
is an AU supported network of European newsroom, which produces, translates, shares articles and investigations, as well as tools based on data on European affairs. And we are in Vox Europe, a proud founder and editorial co coordinator of the network. So uh, you've also co-founded Techtopia, and uh, maybe I will give you the floor uh, very, very quickly, just if you want to add anything, whether I missed anything in my presentation, and then we'll present um, uh, Alexander. Yeah, so uh, Alexander Fanta, you're an Austrian born, but Brussels based usually uh, journeys for Netzpolitik, which is a German news site that covers digital rights. Uh, you report especially on technology and digital policy making uh, in the EU. So big news uh, going on these days. I also wanted to mention PanelFit, the PanelFit project, which is also a EU supported Horizon 2020 project centered on the impact of technological innovation on citizens' lives, focusing on data protection, privacy, and artificial intelligence. And you'll find the, the, the link in the chat as well. So how's the evening going to, to, to be? Uh, it's going to be basically an hour of debate. We start with about 20, 20, 30 minute questions by uh, Jan Paolo and I, followed by 20 to 30 minutes questions from you, the audience. And after that, we'll have a more informal moment where your microphones, which are shut at the moment, will be open, and you'll be will, you'll be able to interact with the uh, with, you know with, with one another. Uh, you can, of course, as I said before, already write your question in the chat. We'll take them along during the evening, and you can ask them, of course, in English. But if you wish, also in French, Italian, Spanish, and even German, and we'll translate them um, and uh, answer them, or not us, but rather our guests would answer them. So we have a tradition we really like. Could we ask you to just in the chat say from which country you come from or which countries you come from and in which town or countryside you're based tonight? Thank you. So you can just write it in the chat and so we can start the debate. Okay, thanks, uh, Catherine. So let's uh, let's begin with our host. Um, host. Um, so I guess, sorry. So when did you get interest in big tech and why? Maybe we'll start with uh, Alexander uh, on this. Um, yeah, so before I became a tech journalist, I was a political reporter um, for the Austrian press agency. And I, um, uh, I mean, there were a couple of big stories this decade, no doubt. But I think at some point I started to realize that um, there's, there was one kind of set of very powerful actors uh, we see emerging that nobody really was watching that closely, especially in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, that these actors I'm talking about are the big tech companies. I mean, the, within the last decade, the, Basically, my the decade of my my working life, they um, be, went from you know being basically still startup companies to you know um, stock market hotshots to the most valuable companies on the planet, and the decisions these companies make about free speech, about um, issues uh, surrounding hate, disinformation, online commerce, uh, um, up to geopolitics shape our lives. So I thought this is a story I want to be part of. And uh, three years ago, I joined Let's Politic. Um, and shortly after joining, I moved to Brussels to be, I, I, I usually describe myself as the only um, person, the only German speaking journalist in Brussels who only does tech policy. I mean, to be fair, uh, there's Lina Rusch with the Tagesspiegel who also um, covers pretty much the same beat, but I think she's based in Amsterdam. Yeah, so basically I'm, I'm that person who, who goes to every midday briefing and asks the data protection question, but I think that's important. Okay. And Alex Andreas, what about you? Yeah, well, I started out um, my journalistic career mainly focusing on sports and politics um, but with a keen interest in, in geopolitics. 
combined with my work in social media, I began to connect a lot of dots between um, big tech's rising um, usership and how that combines with um, shaping um, political policy. And so um, in the last few years, I've been writing reports for the European Data Journalism Network and Vox Europe, just trying to shed a shed light on, on the workings of, of big tech, how they affect almost every industry uh, and providing a, a data backed um, basis of my, of my work in order to lay it out with the facts as opposed to um, just opinion. And in the last couple of years, I've created my own website called Big Techtopia, which is, which is explaining how Big tech is uh, has its hand in every industry and is rising at such a rate that it will be, if not the major, one of the major um, forces in in just about every industry. Mm -hmm. And by laying it out in such a way where people can cross reference and not just uh, rely on conjecture and speculation. And so, in the last year and a half, as we know, tech. It's becoming more and more prominent in our lives. Um, since COVID, of course, it's, it's moved a lot of plans forward. And I think it's something that the general public, even if they wanted to avoid this topic, it's impossible now because it's involved in every aspect of our life. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We, we can start maybe with a very, um, with fresh news. Uh, maybe you want, Maybe you'll be able to comment, you know, and, and uh, give us some some um, comparison with the, with Europe. I mean, Facebook blocked, as mo most most people know, I think, news content in Australia and content sharing. And I'd like to have your thoughts about it and and whether you think it could happen in Europe too. So it's I asked the question to both of you really. So it's well, I'd say it's like a, a stark example of how these companies feel they're above national law and regulation and it's almost like a, a power play to send a message to other countries who have threatened to do the same in the past i mean uh, france has been um threatening similar action on on facebook in regards to distribution of revenues um regarding media content and images and so on and it seems like australia is almost like a, a test run uh, of the global reaction um, and but of course, it's not even the first time that big tech has had these altercations with European countries in the past. I mean, in 2012, uh, Spain um, pushed for Google to pay publishers for the content they used, and Google just shut down Google News in Spain. I mean, it's not easy to determine who's going to be the ultimate winner in this, but as we see, big tech has such power that it can act above uh, governments. Okay. And Alexander, maybe, uh, on this uh, recent news? I think it's really interesting looking at the, the broader relationship between publishers and, and the large platform companies. I think at some point um, uh, it became obvious that, uh, that the platforms were, were, were slowly but surely absorbing um, the business space in which the publishers are operating. So, I mean, um, 10, 15 years ago, everyone thought that publishers would just move on the net and earn the same type of money with advertising on the net that they did offline, and that would sustain journalism. Now we know this is not true. And one of the reasons that is not true is because of the advertising model that Google and Facebook built, where they track users around the web and um, personalize advertising to the user, which um, kind of allows them to circumvent the tricky question of where the where the ad is actually displayed. I mean, it can be displayed anywhere. If, if, if it's media, the ad is following. Then I don't care if it's on some you know fake news website or the New York Times website. And I th I think that um, that business model makes these companies so dangerous. At the same time, um, this is the, this is the question that is now at stake. What the Australian publishers were basically saying we're just uh, we want a small cut from that profit. This is not uh, the Australian law is not um, fundamentally challenging uh, Facebook's and Google's data-driven surveillance business model. It's just 
uh, a small way of, of demanding um, just a bit of money to pay for um, for, for, for journalism. And I think that, that the companies are fighting even this small measure uh, with such uh, a heft. Uh, it just moves to show uh, what, what, what type of fight we, will, we are looking at if um, you know, we, we, we're talking about serious money from digital taxes or even breaking up companies like Google and Facebook. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, let, let's go to the, um, let's move to the, the, the topic of uh, this evening's uh, meeting, uh, meaning uh, the uh, personal freedom and data privacy and uh, safety. Uh, even more with the pandemic, we saw that we, uh, we are asked to swap to some extent uh, a little bit of freedom if, and of privacy for more safety, in this case, for more uh, health safety. Um, should, we, should we worry uh, because, of, uh, because of this? Um, because if you think about countries like China, they, they manage uh, to curb the pandemic through uh, widespread surveillance and, uh, and tracking. And uh, they had, uh, in the end, less, less dead people than um, uh, Western countries. So should we be worried by this kind of uh, widespread surveillance and data gathering by both private and public organizations? I would, I would like to challenge the notion that um, there is an inherent benefit in surveillance. Um, I think that the, you, you will find in the pandemic that um, other places had similar results as China had. Um, and not because they were doing surveillance, but because they simply enforced very, very hard lockdowns, you know, not leaving the house and so forth. And um, the, the countries that we now see that are, you know, going on lives almost as if um, we never had the virus in the first place are those that are quite insular, like Australia and New Zealand, who can lock themselves um, off the rest of the world. And that is something that Europe doesn't stand for and it simply isn't possible here. It's, at the same time, I think um, uh, Europe showed uh, some flexibility uh, in, in developing um, digital tools quickly. I mean, the, the COVID apps in many countries are a good example of, of a solution that is both quite data protection friendly and still um, you know, does what, what the technology is meant to do. Um, nonetheless, um, we, have, we have found that it doesn't really work that well, but that, I think that has nothing to do with the technology. I, I, th I think that the, the idea that there is some kind of balance between liberty on one hand and, uh, um, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and security uh, on the other is, is a false balance. I, I'm, 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 not seeing, I'm not seeing the inherent benefit um, from, from surveillance that some people talk about, uh, and that, that also applies to giving up on, you know, on data privacy and, and another issue. Andreas, your thought? I mean, I'd say I'm certainly skeptical um, about the numbers that China are releasing and whether they really have combated the pandemic uh, as they claim uh, to have. Um, and I think that's good insight into what Europe and the rest of the world could be headed for if we continue to outsource our minds to central authority and constrain freedom of information uh, to the point where, um, well, we, where there's not enough um, variety of information to to determine facts and and listen to a variety of uh, opinions on the issue. And generally, I think um, COVID nineteen, as I wrote for for Vox Europe recently, is that it has served as a pretext. Um, for the imposition of uh, very drastic uh, surveillance measures that aren't going to remain in place only for the pandemic. We've created a digital infrastructure now which uh, will remain and it almost allows for even harsher surveillance down the line under the guise of public safety, which, as, as I said before, the information stream is constrained um, into the hands of uh, very few vested companies, big tech companies in particular, um, who, who largely have benefited from this. And so I contest that, um, that uh, it's actually led to 
it, it's fast tracked a lot of the things that were in the pipeline, but were faced with serious opposition due to privacy and surveillance concerns. And now they've gone out the window because, uh, because of this. So I think there needs to be a more open debate about whether this is worth the, the trade off. Mm. Your mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, it's Catherine's mic, which is off. Okay, so, so let's see that to, to avoid a. Okay. Okay, thank you. you. Apparently, only you could do it, so I shouldn't turn it off anymore. Uh, thank you. I don't know whether, um, yeah, if we go for maybe a little bit in time, uh, but I think that's an interesting question. To, talking about this. Uh, huge concentration of power uh, of the big tech. How did they manage to achieve that? Uh, so much power into their hands. It seems like a giant question, but it's been over the years, I suppose. And, and how, how did it happen? Is it mainly through lobbying uh, expenditure, huge sums of money? Or what is the responsibility of governments as well in, in this situation? Well, I'd say it's a, it's a combination of uh, of different things. I say it's largely because of us and our personal choices. I mean, in the times where Alex said before, like big tech companies were just platforms, um, social media networks, search engines, and so on, and they've morphed into something so much bigger. But at the time, we were willing to give over our data that has helped construct these um, giant corporations. And um, so in the end, we end up with these platforms that almost know us better than ourselves and feed us information and content based on, on the information we've provided. So, of course, there's our contribution in this. And as you said before, um, certainly lobbying uh, creates this um, wall around themselves where, where they push for legislation that benefits them and helps to even- but it did work, it, it did work very well. Sorry? I mean, it, it, it did work very well, the lobbying. I mean, it's been extremely efficient. Yeah, definitely. Is it I mean, only a question of big money or, as you, you said, we were responsible in a way, but most people didn't realize, I suppose, that by- It's not, thing. It's not a, necessarily a, a matter of blame is, is the fact that we weren't so conscious of mass mm. privacy or we didn't believe that they would morph into what they have become and the more and more information that comes out we see how our our data is misused and also collected in mm. in in opaque ways um and I, and I believe now that people are becoming more more conscious mm. they are way rather more, late we are, but not too late, I believe. Not too late, okay. So that, that gives us some hope, especially for the last questions we have. But um, <laughs> would you agree with that, uh, Alexander? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to um, chip into that. I, I think also that we have to look at what happened in the last 10 years. I mean, um, uh, a lot of the concerns we now have were simply under the radar of regulators. And so, I mean, the um, kind of wild west of data protection um, that made the rise of the big tech companies uh, possible is now uh, being addressed. I mean, we have GDPR now, but also um, other measures are being taken. So that is one aspect. Also, I think competition authorities were still like 10 years ago were um, not, I'd not say blind, but they were, I think, a bit naive about what, what you know, um, what would happen. And I think that that was, uh, it was absolutely um, uh, vital to the, to, the, to the rise of big tech that the regulators were sleeping at the wheel. I mean, when you think Google bought a small company called DoubleClick and suddenly um, was not, uh, not only selling ad space on its own website, but uh, controlling a ad, ad network. Uh, Facebook bought uh, Instagram. It bought uh, WhatsApp in uh, 2014. And without these acquisitions, the sheer force of, the, uh, of these big tech companies would be a lot smaller. Um, and I think the same... Um, uh, happened with other tech companies before. I mean, 
would Microsoft be the behemoth it would be today if um, you know public authorities throughout Europe um, had said, oh, we we're not going to purchase from that company anymore because we will have blocking effects. Let's uh, find alternatives or develop them ourselves. So I think that um, the, the, the role of, of, of regulators in allowing big tech to become dominant uh, is something we need to, to look at. Otherwise, we, uh, we are, you know, we're at the threat of, of kind of just repeating the narrative that their product was so great. Um, I think we shouldn't do that. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, there's already one question, you know, I think it's it's more on what um, Andrea said just said before. Uh, so Sonia Eisen says, how is it that you say that this is not too late? So I think maybe we shouldn't wait until the very end of the conversation to, to, to talk about this uh, hope or... So I'll let you answer, um, Andreas, because you... You brought this optimism yeah, in the sure. conversation. <laughs> Should I address it now or, or at the end? Yeah, maybe you can. I mean, you can, yeah, it's... Well, if, no, I'm not just going to okay. say that... Uh, no, I, I, I'm generally not blindly optimistic, nor am I saying that uh, one way or another it, it is likely. Uh, I just believe that um, as we've reached kind of critical mass on, on, on the... On, on the understanding or at least the, the exposure that big tech companies are getting now, I, arguably wouldn't have been possible without major scandals or, mm. or being involved in our lives or in, in every aspect of our lives in order for us to react. Because as I said before, that perhaps we weren't so privacy conscious before when we mm. treated them just the search engines or just the social network uh, or messaging apps. We now, uh, many people who previously never considered the wider threats do. And as a result, we can take our own personal choices and push for legislation that might uh, better safeguard the public. Uh, so that's why I believe that it's not, not all hope is lost. Okay. <laughs> I also would, would like to um, chip sure, in. Sure, I was going to, yeah, sure. Don't hesitate to hop in, you know, when either of you talk, you know, I think we can just be. Uh... Definitely. Yeah, so um, I would like to just add what Andrea said, really, because I, I think he's, he's fundamentally right. Um, what, I would, what I would point out is that, you know, we had, um, there were situations in, in, the, in the past, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, not this century, but, but other centuries, where we've, you, you had a quite a, a strong concentration um, of economic power in the hands of a few companies. I mean, in America, the famous example of Standard Oil, basically controlling uh, a very substantial amount of, of all the oil sold and, and having a, a quasi-monopoly. Um, and, 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 um, and, and I, I think it's a bit different with big tech because there are still alternatives. I mean, that the lock-in is, is not complete and it's not, it's not like oil. Um, we can, uh, absolutely, you can absolutely run, you know, kind of uh, buy web space, not going to Amazon. You can absolutely have an email account without using Gmail. Um, and even the Google search engine is not without alternatives. If you look at a, a host of um, new small independent companies um, from, from Europe, but also obviously Bing, uh, which is a Microsoft product. So um, in some ways, um, the, some, some economists talk about the, the, the moat that these companies have built um, a kind of uh, 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 a kind of uh, uh, geographic barrier that that um, uh, keeps competition from entering their fortress uh, and stealing their their thunder. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure that um, this moat is as impregnable as some economists um, make 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 it out to be. I think that um, it's quite viable to have competition at least as soon as you set a few, reset a few parameters in the economy. And I think that is what the European Union is basically just trying to do. But I think a lot more needs to be done, um, especially in, um, you know, kind of, for instance, telling, um, you know, make, doing industrial policy with software, saying, like, telling public authorities, uh, you know, if you want to have strong data protection in the European Union, then don't use Google in schools, uh, don't use... Uh, Microsoft Windows, um, uh, you know, don't don't buy a license for that for every computer of every public administrator, every every civil servant. 
And I think these are the kind of steps that can be taken right now. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Alex. When you see that, for example, the European Commission uh, runs on Microsoft, uh, I mean, the European Commission. <laughs> So it's a good example of uh, the, why those companies are so, so powerful. It's also because their products are very efficient, it, it has to be said. They, are, they have the, the means to make them efficient. And when they didn't develop the more efficient one, often they, they end up buying it, like Facebook did with, um, uh, with WhatsApp, for example. Um, and, and they have the means, and they are probably the few ones who have the means uh, to do so. Uh, regarding the, the close environment that you, the, an alternative environment that you mentioned, uh, of course, you know, in Russia, for example, they use, people tend to use the contact more than uh, WhatsApp, um, but because there's a, there's a kind of freedom of speech issue in Russia and in China, it's even more locked. Uh, because some of the Western big techs are simply not allowed to um, to operate in China or decided not to because of the, the government's uh, pressure. So uh, why is it so hard to regulate those, those big tech uh, companies? Why can't we trust them when they say that uh, self-regulation is the best option? And in the end, why are governments so powerless? Uh, with regards to them, I, I think if we, if we will one day uh, write the economic uh, the, the history textbook on this era, I think we will see first the phase where European governments thought it's not an issue, then they uh, moved on to saying we can't do anything about it, uh, and then you know basically we're now in the in the in the let me say post GDPR era where we're starting to see oh well, we can actually do something about it, uh, we just have to find. Um, you know, the, the technocratic means to do so. So I think that we're, the commission has been on a very, very steep learning curve over the past years, learning how to do actually all this stuff. Um, and the, uh, one, one of the first places where they, I think they really learned the tricks is, is all these competition cases against Google, but also other companies, where I think you can, they folded on, on a few important um, uh, competition cases early in the decade, and then they realized we have to go through with this and especially more important than the actual fines or the non-financial remedies where, you know, you tell um, Google that in their Android app store, they, they, they need to, um, they can't have a lock-in where they pre-install all their apps and on the same phone, you, you can't have another, um, you can't have another type of app pre-installed. So I, I think that these types of things, um, yeah, um, that, that there, there is an element um, where I think Europe was too, uh, trusting, uh, maybe also of um, of of America and of um, uh, of of the idea that the U.S. would ultimately force the companies um, to fix problems uh, where where they where they listen most to mm -hmm. politics. Um, and I think now uh, Europe has gained the self confidence slowly but surely to say, well, if the U.S. isn't addressing all these issues, that we have to. Mm -hmm. Okay, is of course one question we could ask ourselves is why is there no European competitor to the GAFAM? Not maybe to recreate a GAFAM, but at least a strong alternative. Andreas, you wanna? I think Europe was, was quite slow um, compared to the growth that uh, you know, Silicon Valley had in the US and obviously China, and they kind of accepted that they were going to be dependent on these services as opposed to creating something of their own. And now we see from a geopolitical standpoint almost how trouble, troubling it is, the idea that Europe has to be um, dependent on one or the other major power. And it's another one, one of those things that I just think it's reacted late to, and now there's supposedly plans to, to rebuild the, this area where, well, as Alex mentioned before, that it's so difficult to now um, get past the, uh, they have such strength, these big tech companies that it, it's hard um, 
to to build something from scratch and become a leader let's say because mm -hmm. um, for example facebook as you mentioned just now that they tend to purchase the competition uh and as a result i think it's just a late reaction and it takes something quite unique to to break this stronghold yeah and i really i think i really want to stress um we should ask the question how desirable is it even to have that large corporation should we um count it as a success um, that a company is allowed to to um, operate in various um you know kind of uh, bordering markets and allowing to acquire market share this clearly has anti-competitive implications even if under european antitrust law that is not per se a problem so i think to a certain extent um the, Euro the european model should be um rather than having fostering a few large corporations we should have an ecosystem within which many many uh small and medium-sized enterprises have equal um, equal uh, footing for competition. Um, and I think one, one way to, for instance, to, to achieve that is by promoting open source uh, in public tenders, um, because um, open source tends to be something that um, SMEs have an easier time um, taking up, developing, um, and where um, the success of one company is not uh, to the detriment uh, of the success of another country, but actually aids and sustains it. So. I think the, um, the European values that the Commission likes to talk about, one way of bringing them into the digital era is to say, well, let's create a new, uh, you know, a, a, a new way of thinking about um, successful tech companies. Mm. Yeah. Um, I see what you mean. So, um, so that there will be, uh, there is possible, there is room for a European way of, um, of, um, a European big tech way, although there is a big difference with the, the um, with the US uh, also in Europe, is that there are very few um, uh, potential investors like v VCs, uh, venture capitalists, like in, in the US who would invest uh, uh, large amounts of money in uh, big tech companies, uh, like in the US. How, how come? Uh, there was a successful um, fintech startup called Wirecard, but um... Didn't, didn't go so well, apparently. Um. You know why? <laughs> You're pulling faces now, but no, but, but um, I mean, it, it's true though that American capitalism um, is a lot more stock market based than European, um, <clears throat> um, the European way of doing business. So I think that, that is one of the reasons these companies could grow so large so quickly and um, is that there are investors in American stock markets who gave, you know, a 23 year old Mark Zuckerberg um, basically billions um, and um, the Euro European way of growing companies is simply more cautious I'd say I mean ag again this is the question of do we want to emulate that model of capitalism um, for, to have the same results or just you know are different results actually more desirable but I mean that having said that it's not entirely true that there is no kind of European big tech type companies so Spotify is I think now valued at more than 100 um, billion euros. Um, and um, and uh, SAP in Germany is a very boring company, but still that does technology. Um, and a lot of the um, more conventional um, uh, older companies are trying to become tech companies. As you can see now in the car industry, they're all thinking about autonomous vehicles. They're thinking about connected cars. So um, I, I'd not say it's hopeless in terms of uh, competing uh, with America and the world market for European technology companies. Mm, I see. Thanks for not having mentioned Skype. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's owned by Microsoft now, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it was Finnish and uh, and now it's uh, it's American. So well, was, it, was it even Estonian? Just to maybe there's Estonians in the audience. Oops. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay. We, 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 not that's so. Go fact check that. I, I usually just Google. No, I don't Google that before I, I, I search on DuckDuckGo before I make such assertions. Um, so what is ultimately the, the big stack uh, agenda? Is it only profit or do they still want to change the world for the better? Uh, Andreas, what's, 
your point well, on that. The combination of profit and power. And I think the former serves the latter. And mm. if it remains unchallenged or not challenged enough, it has the capability to, to almost become um, a layer above uh, governments. And as, as you see there, they're creating this layer on top of pretty much every industry. So from identification, uh, banking, health, and so on. And when these techni technological measures become a necessity, so for example, like digital ideas we're saying, or health passports and so on, where people are compelled to, to have them and use them, otherwise they won't have access to certain services or won't be able to go to work and so on. Mm. Whether it's legal or otherwise in the country, this is almost um, supranational where um, they can set their own terms and if you don't abide then you just you miss out and I feel that if you see what they're doing in other parts of the world for example it, it doesn't really represent this altruistic um, image that they that they tried to give off I mean for example there's well, in India let's say where big tech companies are pushing to, 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 to dominate this emerging market. Um, we've got companies like Facebook offering supposedly free services, a uh, program called Free Basics, which would go to rural areas of the country and uh, provide free internet, supposedly. But that free internet was with Facebook as the homepage and a select few partners uh, on this platform. And, the news and the information is very much geared towards their interest and a Western interest. So uh, the threat that I see from, um, I guess when, when we talk about big tech, we're mainly talking about the US companies and, and they're not the only ones um, involved in, in such activities, but there's definitely um, the side of them that is much more than, than tech that it seeks to grow into just about every sector and it's profit first but that serves to gain power and as we see have such influence uh, politically i also see um, i really see the tech companies as the story of you know people who are now you know in their 30s maybe some in their 40s um who have become very successful overnight and i think there is some such a thing as a kind of Silicon Valley ideology, which um, is, is a bit elusive, but it's it's a mi mix of the um, the values and the, um, the the thinking that these people have have had have had and de um, uh, developed over the years. I think there's a certain basic strain of libertarianism that runs through what these companies are doing, um, and that is kind of um, yeah, I, I, in some ways deeply adversarial to. The European tradition of, of managing um, conflicts between, you know, state entities, uh, uh, trade unions, uh, social partners, parties, and the like. So I think there's um, th there's there's some way for Silicon Valley where they, they just love to s skip all these uh, stakeholders, all these tedious democratic processes, um, and just try to set up their own processes. And I think that is. Um, that is basically at the heart of the whole value conflict. So now Facebook is setting up the, an oversight board, which is basically a constitutional court on free speech run by Facebook. Um, and I, th I think European, you know, like in Europe, I think nobody would really have the idea of just doing that, of setting up parallel quasi-state structures in the place of real state structures. I think that is a very kind of um, American way of, of doing and thinking things. Mm. Yeah, you you mentioned uh, Andreas the, the fact that um, um, uh, in some countries Facebook is uh, well, you mentioned India uh, is offering uh, like a free internet operated by Facebook, but it's it's true that in for many people also in the West, uh, basically internet is social media. I mean, my uh, eleven years old daughter uh, goes 
for her internet is only uh, platforms. She, she doesn't use the World Wide Web as we uh, as we used to. So this means that for a lot of of people, the internet equals uh, only uh, a private company that is providing a uh, service uh, linked to its own um, in, its own uh, its own services and um, and products. Um, the the um, it makes me think that Google, uh, its motto was "Don't be evil," but in 2018 they removed it. Uh, is it uh, is it significant that they they did so, or is it because they are now they are evil, or they can openly be evil, or I think they realized they'd be sued for false advertising eventually with that <laughs> with that tagline. Um, but uh, as I said before, I mean. You just have to look at actions more than more than slogans. And some might say, okay, evil is is a harsh or heavy term to use, but it's certainly not in the interest of the majority, I'd say. Um, and that goes for matters of privacy um, and just about every other area that it's invested in. It doesn't seem to be um, basing the fund fundamental um, values that that the user looks to gain from these from these outlets um, as a priority. Mm. And I think that um, it, it's better that they that they remove that tagline. <laughs> Do you want to say something about that uh, as well? Um, I, I actually, I'd, I'd like to address a question um, in the chat, which is kind of related. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was going to ask it, but you can go ahead. We just need to read it for everybody to know. So the question is from Paul, and he's ask, uh, he asks, uh, what do we know about internal debates within these tech companies on data privacy? Are employees pushing from inside for more transparency? Does it have an impact? Um, so... What we've, what we've heard before from, from these companies is that whenever the employees push for any kind of change, it, 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 it very often it faces a very stark backlash. So uh, Timnit Gebru, uh, a um, person working in Google on, on, on the ethics of artificial intelligence, uh, was uh, left, left the company after, crit after publicly criticizing the company. Um, and uh, you had um, big debates uh, not least around the Google walkouts, where people were criticizing the company for failing to address um, uh, sexual harassment. And um, yeah, I, 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 we've had all kinds of um, conflicts within Amazon, for instance, where uh, its warehouse employees are aggressively um, tracked for, for um, um, uh, kind of surveilled for, for all kinds of things, including um, uh, labor organizing practices. But coming back to the question about data privacy, I think, um, I bet there are a lot of debates and from what we can piece together from lawsuits, from uh, whistleblower testimony, there, there is um, significant misgiving um, within, within the employees of, I think, more or less all the big tech companies on how the companies operate, what their business model is, how much data they hoover up from users. But um, I mean, what is the, what is the way to um, kind, of, kind of deal with that kind of criticism? The company certainly will block it. So um, do these employees have any way to affect change within the company? Not at least not an American model. Again, here I'm, 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 on, on the, on the, on the um, um, kind of, um, you know, I, I might come off here as a bit anti-American, but in, in German companies, at least and in several other European companies, there are works councils where the workers are represented. Uh, at some point, they get a, a seat on the board or have their say. Um, and in American companies, that simply is not doable. So I think the, one of the undertold stories of the last decade is um, the, um, the big reservations of big tech uh, workers, but how little also they were able to influence the policies of these companies. I just wanted to add one, one more thing um, to what you mentioned about Google um, employees and uh, going against certain um, workings of, of Google that they disagree with. And just a couple of years ago, um, Google was contracted by the, the Pentagon to, to undergo a, um, a 
a program on on drones using automated uh, machinery and so on. And the, once this was uh, leaked via email uh, between the employees that it was going to be used for targeted drone strikes, the companies protested on mass. There was more than a thousand signatures. So what China, uh, what Google did was simply shut down that program in the U.S. and went and um, created a, an AI lab in Beijing and developed the same technology and based on the Chinese constitution change hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, it seems that any private company set up in China has to share um, technology and uh, data with the Chinese government and military. So uh, as we see, that it's not a matter of ethics or even national affiliation. It's about expanding its technology, they, uh, uh, sorry, expanding its market uh, to sell its technological advancements. It doesn't really um, stand up for any particular um, political side or, or nation. Okay. There's one question from Katya. Um, for both of you, actually. Uh, indeed, Standard Oil is an historical, very good example of standardization. What do you think, Alexander Andreas, what do you think about the role uh, that Europeans uh, play today or should play in international organizations for digital technology standardization? <laughs> I'm not sure I pronounce it correctly. So I don't know who, who wants to start. I, I'm happy to start. So I, I think standards are the, the modern, are the tyranny of the modern world, and whoever sets them gets to yield enormous power. Um, I did a story um, two, three years back uh, about how um, the European Union at one point wanted to standardize um, the uh, charger for smartphones, but also especially the um, the port where the charger goes in. So this is a uh, USB-C. But uh, Apple is uh, the only company significantly still doesn't use USB-C ports for charging, but their own um, proprietary uh, charging port, um, which allows them to charge uh, money from the manufacturers. And um, also kind of, um, you know, um, they have their own ecosystem, um, do things their own way, make, make, make their users um, 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 use appliances that they have approved or sell themselves. So um, I, I think it would have been nice for the European Union to actually um, kind of really dictate a standard. Um, and yeah, I think in other respects, um, the, the same thing applies. Standardization has a lot to do with um, setting, uh, you know, create, creating a pathway for companies to do things in a certain way or not. Um, and, and another example that comes to mind is um, there's uh, a, a larger, larger and larger policy debate about interoperability. So should we mandate WhatsApp to open its services um, so that other people using other messengers can, can inter-communicate with people using WhatsApp? And that also would work via standardization. So um, this is also um, one debate where Europe needs to be more present in helping to shape these standards, helping to, to define um, uh, how, um, yeah, how, how we can... Uh, kind of uh, jump the molds that the large digital companies have built for themselves via their own standards. Just to say, we, we um, Andreas, did you want to say something about that question as well? No, that was, it was along the same lines of what uh, Alexander said, that it, it, it's certainly um, something that international organizations could contribute to uh, it could be argued that it's it's um, the responsibility of, of the individual uh, user as well to kind of push for the change they want to see because companies often simply react to to, to sales and, and and profits and uh, by taking a dent towards um, profits through through action and different choices, then it's more likely that we'll see change like that, not just by depending on on 
legislation or, or, or a leader, let's say, to, to solve, solve these issues. Um, okay. There's a question by Tim Hinkliff uh, from the US, if I remember well. Um, so the question is quite long, um, but let's say that, okay. Organizations pushing digital identity and COVID passports always speak of bolstering digital inclusion. But it seems to Tim <laughs> that digital inclusion can go hand in hand with physical exclusion. Uh, Andreas, you wrote about the growing risk of coercive tactics to get people on board with digital ads, and IDs, sorry, and COVID passports. It seems like a catch-22. If these digital tools are supposed to be optional, what happens to those who opt out? What purpose do digital IDs serve in the context of reopening economies post-COVID if they are not mandatory or not enforced? Well, that's the big question that I, I mentioned in the piece, or implied at least, that um, the way it's framed is that these are just optional tools and they're not going to be imposed on anyone uh, in an obligatory or legal sense, but it's, uh, it's deceptively worded because as many um, politicians of different European countries uh, have stated that it's gonna be obligatory for, or it could be they're discussing or, or, or planning to make it obligatory for, for air travel or for the return to the workplace or for football stadiums or, or whatever it might be. And that takes out all personal autonomy. It, it, and this is, again, as I, as I mentioned before about how um, big tech often gives the illusion of choice, but there's, um, as we see in practice, that it's coercion into um, a more centralized uh, surveillance system that will take away fundamental freedoms uh, from, from the individual. Yeah, I can only really agree with what Andreas said. I think, um, yeah, also I, I, I think we should be vigilant of um, governments providing uh, the infrastructure with digital ideas that can be used then by companies to, um, to do tracking, to force uh, users to log in for every service, even for services they don't require, um, you know, collecting user data at all. And um, yeah, I, I think the worst of worlds would be one where um, still everyone is kind of um, more or less forced by social convention to have a Facebook account or WhatsApp account or whatever. And then that is linked to the government issue digital ID, I think that would be terrible. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the best world is one where you can preserve anonymity in doing most things on the net. Um, and uh, a government digital identity is used to access government services, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. But if people now we're talking about the pandemics, if people are told if you have a, a, a health passport that certifies that you've been vaccinated and that you are COVID free, let's say, and you can get out this way and go back to your normal life, <coughs> while if you don't have the passport or if you uh, if you are still let's say. Um, uh, COVID positive, you have to stay home. Huh? Uh, one can uh, imagine that people would agree with uh, having this kind of uh, passports um, without thinking of the possible consequences and consequences and applications on um, on a wider scale. I, I think that is true. Uh, it's true what you're saying, but uh, at the same time, it, it's it matters a lot with how exactly these um, passports are being done. So is it in a way where this is kind of locked in a central database that every, um, you know, every policeman, every border control agent in Europe will have access to? Or is it in a uh, very cleverly uh, done encrypted way only on one local device that only um, you have to give permission to access to? I mean, like you can do this in a thousand different ways. And I think just the very way you do this um, is, is the important one. And of course, there are um, fundamental rights objections to linking important you know kind of freedoms to ha having a vaccination um so I, I i don't think the right for instance to demonstrate or uh, the right to free speech should be in any way linked to um uh, an immunity or or a vaccination passport 
this. Uh, and again, it, it, it sets the precedent that um, this would be the new the new normal. And once you accept this um, coercion for one for one um, vaccine or for one virus, then it makes it permissible for just about anything else. Um, and so I, I, I really disagree that, that this is, you know, being suggested as, as a return to uh, to getting the uh, to to travel by air by uh, to rebuild the, the tourism industry and so on. That it, it's it's purely a matter of uh, surveillance and control, and it, it would permit these tech companies and governments to impose just about any any intrusive measure. Uh, mm. And it's very falsely put across as optional when it's threatening people, not from just, let's say, luxury, but we're talking about return to the workplace or to travel. So um, it sets a very dangerous precedent, I think. Mm. There's one uh, question from Viviane maybe you can answer fairly quickly. What happens if I'm COVID negative and I refuse to vaccinate? I, I don't know what that. Yeah. Then it should be their their personal choice, and they should be allowed mm -hmm. to travel just like uh, anyone else. And if someone, for example, is so fearful, let's say, of, of traveling, or if they have um, reasons. Um, to be particularly uh, concerned, then I, I suggest that they, you know, take their decisions on on how to to remain as, as safe as possible. But I, as I illustrated in the in the article, uh, just to indicate how it's not as unanimous as it's being claimed. This um, openness. To vaccination, particularly at the beginning, at the mm. at this stage, uh, on the top fifteen um, countries by population were overwhelmingly against. Even though that differs uh, when they were asked uh, whether they would allow it after six months or after a year, but the initial um, uh, the current period we find ourselves in now is that the majority of of people would be against. Um, uh, taking it and particularly when it's linked to to digital ID and therefore mm -hmm. I think it would be very like it's extremely premature to be discussing such a possibility now. Okay just maybe we've been now you know debating for an hour so maybe as I suppose this question might be a very important one to conclude if you can just summarize maybe um, your answers as in the form of conclusion. Uh, so at the end of the day, how can we users protect our privacy and personal data and still take advantage of the social platforms and the tech services? And, and uh, what are the, the real power of, of, of users? Is it maybe to boycott sometimes big tech or switching to non-profit platform? What, what's mm -hmm. your... Your view on this? After that, um, I'd say you know boycott might be strong, uh, although I'm, I'm not against it in, in in some cases. But certainly, there's the need for the public to realise that the power is in their hand. I mean, mm. it's, uh, to draw a parallel with another industry, um, for example, the the meat industry. Let's say. Ten years ago, it was unthinkable that the big fast food outlets like McDonald's and Burger King um, would change their ways because they're so big and they're so powerful. But people's choices, let's say, of uh, reducing meat consumption has led these companies to, to, to take action, not because they've suddenly become um, interested in, in helping the environment or, or, or something like that. It's just purely about profit. And once they see a dent in these profits from people's choices, people going towards more privacy-oriented platforms or search engines or messaging mm. services, then I, I believe they'd be forced to act. That's just one side of it. But 
it was a very good illustration of 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 that power of that consumer power in the recent signal and whatsapp episode that as soon as whatsapp um instructed uh, or rather let's say threatened to to go along with this new um, privacy update that would share their information with facebook people who had never really taken a a real interest in this area or never really understood the the wider um, data collection practices of these companies suddenly were directly affected because it's, it's an app that they would use on a daily basis around the world and we saw like a such a drastic rise in downloads for privacy oriented messaging services and that's caused facebook to delay this update of terms of services and that's just within a few weeks you know such a such a, a move towards the likes of telegram and uh, signal that facebook suddenly felt the effect and is whether it'll do something we'll see but it, uh, i think that's just a snapshot of, mm. of consumer power yeah okay, and i just to, to to add to that um yeah i think users should ask themselves um, if a service is free, uh, you know, who's, you know, how, how, how is this being paid for? And I think, for instance, with a lot of people um, switching to Signal after WhatsApp um, announced the change in its terms of services, um, if you look at Signal, it's, it's a non-profit. So, I mean, that's, um, that's something that is interesting. Um, also, I, 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 I think I should, um, I would ask people to consider paying for services that they now receive for free. So um, if you're not paying for your email, then ask yourself, what is the business model of the company that, um, that, you, that you have the free email service from? Um, and there's a couple of great um, for, um, you know, email services that you have to pay for, but it also offer higher standards of privacy, encryption. If you use it for professional purposes, by all means, please you know, kind of think about paying five euros a month to have uh, high quality encryption. It's, I mean, a lot of us um, do our most important communications um, over email, so it's certainly worth paying that much. Mm -hmm.